All right. I'm looking for um, the questions. <laughs> so welcome everybody to part two of our Silver Wisdom interview with Dr. Carolyn McMakin, the amazing pioneering author of The Resonance Effect. Um, now we've got a little bit of a, um, an audio glitch today. So Dr. Carolyn can't actually hear us. So we're having to type our messages into the chat box for her. So over to Deborah, first question away, please, which is about ah, how okay. Carolyn believes this works. So how do you think that frequency specific microcurrent and microcurrent actually works in the body? Because so many of the stories of the book sound magical. That's a really good question because in the core seminar slides, we're just now, I've taken the two three-day modules, which are a big improvement, and now I'm putting them together, taking out the redundant material and making it into a five day. And so since, anyway, so I got to update some of the slides. And there's this one slide where we talk about, we have frequencies on channel A that address pathologies or things that go wrong with tissue that make them not work right. And then frequencies for specific tissues. And the frequencies on channel A neutralize the condition for which they're listed except for two frequencies, and those are for um, uh, supporting secretions or increasing secretions and increasing vitality. And um, the next slide, and there's a, an experiment that we did on increasing secretions in the ovary. So we did salivary hormone testing we ran frequencies to increase secretions in the pituitary and estrogen stayed the same. Increased secretions in the adrenals and estrogen stayed the same. And increased secretions in the ovary and estrogen shot up from 1.4 to 37.1 in 30 minutes. It was, yes, that's a good face there. Um, so that's, and that was very tissue specific. So it's like, well, that's interesting. I mean, there's no clinical situation in which you would want to do that, but it did prove the point, which was the point of that experiment. And over time, we found out that 81 hertz increases secretions in the target tissue. And the next slide says, people that deal with energy medicine, or free, if the people think that frequency-specific microcurrent is energy medicine, and somehow sort of woo-woo and magic when you enter that quantum realm, they get all fuzzy headed and they think, oh, if my intentions are pure, I can't do any harm. Like sort of like magic. And the next slide says FSM is not magic. It's applied biophysics. So as far as we can tell, collecting all and analyzing and, and looking at for 20 years, all of the data that we have, it suggests very specifically that the frequencies are somehow interacting with the receptors on the outside of the cell that modify the transcription factors that modify the genes that the cell is choosing to express. So you have, let's say, genes in your Achilles tendon for creating inflammation and substance P and inflammatory whatevers. But those genes are off until the tendon cell down in your Achilles, until your tendon cell has um, uh, detects an injury to the tendon strands that it can't repair in 24 hours. So at 24 hours, the genes start to turn on that create inflammatory chemicals and substance P, which modifies pain. So those genes turn on and we, I spent, I was the patient, I was the lab rat in this one. We spent a year treating my Achilles tendon for inflammation and chronic inflammation and scarring and all of the things that could, should work and didn't work. Nothing. I treated myself for 10 months, 11 months. I was on a cane. My Achilles was the size of two thumbs. And um, then 
I went to a worked at a medical um, meeting at, at a, as an exhibitor, and one of my practitioners was working with me, and she said, "Oh, this feels icky, like it's been torn." So she ran the frequency for torn and broken in the tendon. The contacts got really warm. The pain started to go down. And in 60 minutes, the tendon was this size, never needed another treatment. And it took seven years to understand that data and to fill it in with all the rest of the data we have. And the data suggests that you have to treat what's wrong with the cell in order to change the signaling. So treating inflammation treated the inflammation in the environment or in the tendon, but that lasted 30 minutes. When we treated what was wrong with the tendon, torn and broken, that caused the change in that receptor on the cell that caused the genes to change their expression, that's when we fixed it. So it is applied biophysics. It is not woo-woo. It is not magic. It is very specific. And so the next slide says, your good intentions will not save you from your ignorance, right? So if you intend to do something good by supporting secretions, so the first way we found out this was a thing, supporting secretions in the lungs of somebody with cystic fibrosis. She, this practitioner had cleared out the patient's lungs over 60 minutes, no coughing, coughed up all this junk. It was, she was breathing easily and normally. In 10 seconds, when she put increased secretions in the lung, the lungs filled up again. And her intention was to clear the lungs. And back when she did this was 1997, I think, 98, 98, no, 97. And back then we thought that 81 hertz normalized secretions. She called me at midnight her time and she didn't even say hello. She said, 81 hertz increases secretions. Christy, what happened? And she said, she told me the story about the cystic fibrosis patient. <clears throat> now fast forward, and I, so I've been teaching people this over the years. Fast forward to three years ago, I'm treating a man who's had an unfortunate um, event. Um, he had a facet injection, which he'd had before, no problem. But, and so they get him off, off the table, he's fine. It was not a response to the injection. But in between the procedure room and the recovery room, they take you in a wheelchair. And he apparently dropped his head, fell asleep, and stopped breathing. It must have taken them six minutes to get from the procedure room to the recovery room. And he had a hypox hypoxic brain injury that put him effectively into a, a coma, except it was a coma with his eyes open. It's what it's called locked in. So the person that did the... Um, procedure asked me to treat this man in the nursing home where he was. So I went and I wanted to get his brain working again. So we started at the front, the cortex, then you do the midbrain, then you do the cerebellum, then you do the medulla. He was breathing on his own. So the medulla was working now, but the cortex wasn't working. There was like the lights are on, but nobody's home. So I run the forebrain for hypoxia and you run increased secretions in the forebrain. In the midbrain, I did all the basics, hypoxia, and then there's a frequency to increase secretions. And the midbrain is where the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the limbic system lives in our frequency for the midbrain. And this man who's in a coma, effectively, eyes open but in a coma, breathing through a tracheostomy tube, I ran increased secretions in the midbrain his chin started quivering, about 10 seconds. Tears filled his eyes and started rolling down his cheeks. Yeah, that's a good, that's what I did. It's like, oh my God. And I switched off of that frequency and it took about 30 seconds and that all dried up. His wife dried his tears and we figured out, she said, what happened? I said, I ran this frequency. So we went in and took 
81 hertz and the midbrain out of every program where I had ever put it in by accident. It only ran for one minute, but I did this to this guy in 10 seconds. So when you can make a guy in a coma cry, you know that the frequencies are doing exactly and only what they're said to do. So, yeah, so it's not magic. It's applied biophysics. Uh, we have a fairly good model for it. It's actually testable now, thanks to Diana Cross in Australia. And um, so we'll see. We'll see if we can find a genetics lab to test it because it is testable. So, um, so that's, that's how do they work. They work by changing the cell receptors and um, and affecting cell genetics. Yes, Francesca. Um, Deborah, would you mind just asking what Left happened to the man? <laughs> I just want to know. And your word. And Kevin's not here yet, so I'm doomed. <laughs> so I've sent him a text. So if he arrives, then he can come. He's good at fixing things. Francesca, um, can you can you repeat? So, what you want? and um, how does it impact what menopause? Happened what happened to the man? Did they, did they you have to type it, darling. I can't hear you. What happened to the man? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, what happened to the man? Well, um, eventually, uh, well, uh, probably the best thing I did for him was I came the first time and he was breathing pretty easily. I came the second time and it was really struggling to breathe through the trach. And his wife said, I said, when did that start? Oh, about three days ago when they, four days ago when they changed his trach. I said, did it bleed? Yeah. I said, that's not normal. So it's, she shouldn't struggle like that. And she said, oh, the nurse said it's normal. It's like, no, it's not. It wasn't like that a week ago. So it's not normal. So um, his, they called the, I called the nurse. They called the doctor. The doctor came in and I said, this is not normal. When you change the trach, he bled and he's got a clot in there and you need to go in and take it out. So I came back two days later. Sure enough, there was a big clot in his trach. So now he could breathe more comfortably. We never got his brain to work right. I mean, I can't put tissue back that's not there. Um, she got him home. Uh, got him, he was well enough that he could get home. Um, but uh, brain injury patients with uh, brainstem injuries that bad uh, don't do well. So he died of um, sepsis. They get a bladder infection that they don't find. And by the time they find it, it's in the kidneys and then they die of the infection. So it was, it was fairly quick. Um, she was lovely and forever grateful that I was there. I would go and keep her company and treat him for a couple hours. It's middle of winter here in Portland. So it's filthy cold. Um, it was right around Christmas time too. So it was, it, was, it was a very sweet interaction. I mean, all of us are going to die of something, right? Um, and here's a man that had always had the experience of doing for other people and being the provider and chopping wood and having to do stuff and never accepting help. And so in the last months of his life, he had the experience of being forced to accept help and his wife had the lovely experience of being able to help him as he had helped her so my personal belief is that everything that happens to us there's a lesson for us that's the only reason it's there is so that we can learn something right otherwise what was all this for and um so that's how i make sense of it i've seen so much tragedy and pain and death that it would be disastrous if you couldn't find a meaning in it or help the patient find a meaning in it, right? So um, if you haven't read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, that's a good place to start. And then um, oh, there's one of the books I read on life after life, it might have been Raymond Moody's book on life after life. And he said, when those people that have gotten to the other side and get as far as what they perceive as a um, judgment or a life review the whole life is only reviewed in the in the um in, res in the respect of the two questions were you loving and what did you learn i mean think about it 
That's like, were you loving and what did you learn? So when you weren't loving, did you learn from that? Yeah. And that's it. None of the, did you steal a candy bar when you were eight and so you're going to hell stuff? It, uh, mm -mm. Just those are the two. Those are the two. So, um, so I think the things that we encounter in life can teach us something that way. Um, back to aging and longevity. Menopause, you know, here's the thing with menopause. Um, back when we had a life expectancy of 27 as women or 46 in the beginning of the 19th century, life expectancy for humans, especially for women, because we died so often in childbirth, we died from infectious disease and trauma. Um, life expectancy was 46. Well, menopause wasn't a big bad problem. You died before you got to menopause, right? So now menopause is the hot flashes and the sleeping and the cortisol and the insulin resistance and all of that. And the, I tried using FSM for that. So concussion and um, uh, treating the pituitary, that's kind of fun. Doesn't work, I mean, to turn off hot flashes. So I've been on estrogen patch for uh, 20 some odd years. So the best solution for menopause in my world has been to find an OBGYN that knows what the hell they're doing. So I'm on estrogen progesterone to protect the uterine lining and the breast. There's good research on that. Lowest dose of estrogen. We tried for 20 years to lower my dose and every time I either stopped using it or lowered the dose, I got, um, got hot flashes and wake up all sweaty at three in the mornings. Like that's not working for me. And um, so estrogen, progesterone, and then testosterone in a male, you know, gives them a beard and whatever, but test and oral testosterone in a female is terrible. Um, yeah, that doesn't work. But topical testosterone in a female helps with libido, which is a good thing, uh, helps with muscle recovery and um, muscle um, strength. And uh, just as a little side note, it makes your pubic hair curly. So that's how I regulated my dose. Like if I was using too much, I'd get acne. And if I didn't use enough, my pubic hair got straight. And it's like, well, okay. I can't even tell you how much fun it is to talk to women my age to whom this stuff means something. So that's the best solution for menopause. And then sleep, you have to sleep. So because of my travel schedule, I've been using medication to sleep for 20 years. It's not, my life is not reasonable, right? Even now that I'm not traveling, it's not reasonable. You can't make slides until 7.30 or eight o'clock at night and then expect to go to bed at nine. That's just, no, that's not how you're, brain and endocrine system works. So there's a reason that God invented drugs. Those of you that have more normal lives, where you get to, you know, sit at home and have dinner at 5.30 and wind down and read a book and watch the telly and, and visit with your family and, you know, wind down and be in bed by 8.30 or 9. Um, that's, do that. For me, that's, no. So it's been a combination of using FSM to uh, the concussion protocol is what we use to keep the brain balanced and treating the vagus. The vagus nerve controls the immune system and prevents inflammatory disease and autoimmune disease. It improves your digestion. It improves your voice. Um, it, uh, it beats your heart. It moves your intestines. It keeps inflammation regulated. It keeps your blood sugar down. I mean, the vagus is your friend. And I go on like I have a 90 minute presentation on the Vegas for our advanced practitioners. That's just my favorite in the world. And if you, if you've, has anybody here heard of the Townsend letter? No. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a magazine for health practitioners and health interested patients. It's called the Townsend letter. And this last month it comes out in November, but I think I've written the best article I've ever written on how the vagus interacts with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and multiple chem chemical sensitivities, and how they all relate to the vagus. So um, Jonathan Collins is the publisher, but it's called The Townsend Letter. And um, it's, it's, once he's published it, then I, can, then I can send it out. But I think the vagus 
treating the bakes is the best way to keep your stress levels down, your inflammation levels down, and um, then getting rid of infection. I'd be dead if it wasn't for Mary Ellen Chalmers and Neil Nathan. Mary Ellen found the infection in my jaw, so I've had all those jaw surgeries. Neil found the mold infection in my sinuses and my gut, and he fixed that. So my digestion works, my vagus works. I don't have an infection in my sinuses. God bless my GP. He kept me on oral antibiotics for six years until we got rid of the bone infection and the infection in my sinuses. So chronic infection is one of the most significant causes in aging um, because it creates inflammation and it activates your immune system and it turns off your vagus, right? So if you have root canals, I hate to tell you ladies, but root canals never don't fail. 100% of the time, root canals will fail. And that is because they take out the infected root, right? So you don't feel pain, but there's no way to sterilize a tooth. A tooth is like styrofoam. It's got little tubules that, that feed in and make the root. So they clear out the uh, nerve, they put peroxide and whatever in it, and that kills what's ever in Have you ever tried to sterilize styrofoam? Like that's not working, right? So the bacteria go out through the tubules and into the jaw, and they're anaerobic. They don't care if you seal up the tooth, they're fine. They, they get all the oxygen they need out of the blood supply that's in the bone. And what they eat is the blood supply in the bone. So 15, 20 years later, there's this chronic infection in the bone from the root canal. And the immune system picks it up and says, uh, excuse me, there's, there's bugs here, uh, bu bugs, infection, hello. And so the immune system upregulates the vagus has as its job to tell the brain, uh, excuse me, there's an infection here. And the brain says infection. Well, infection, stress, trauma must mean that you're being eaten by a tiger because tiger spit has lots of germs in it. So the limbic system tells the vagus, it's like, okay, you got to turn yourself down because you're turning off the immune system. So you stop controlling the immune system so the immune system can fight whatever this infection is, wherever it is, I don't see a tiger, but whatever. So the immune system gets dysregulated because the vagus is now off because you have a root canal that you had 19 years ago. And you have no pain because the first thing that the bacteria eat are the blood supply and the nerves and the bone. And they took out the nerves, so there's no pain. So you've got this infection in your jaw that you can't feel, nobody can see it because it doesn't show up in x-rays, it only shows up, that lady with her hand over her mouth must have root canals, I'm really sorry. Anyway, so you have no pain, dental x-rays are normal. No, oh, that's just fine, oh, it's a little tender. Well, don't push on that if that hurts. So, um, so then the immune system gets dysregulated and then we, the patient presents with antithyroid antibodies. Oh, some people just get Hashimoto's, like it's going to come from space, right, and land on you. No. Oh, you just have antithyroid antibodies are one of them. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, that's another one. Um, uh, gastroparesis, SIBO, all of the digestive system disorders come from, even candida comes from the vagus being turned off. Why is the vagus turned off? Well... I went on vacation to India and had a little bit of diarrhea, but nobody ever treated it. Well, you got a parasite. There's a parasite in your gut. Vagus informs the brain. Brain says to the vagus, go off. The vagus goes off. The immune system comes on. The parasite's happy. And you end up being diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis or Hashimoto's thyroid. And it's all because there is something in your system that's turning the vagus, well, that's telling the vagus that there's a problem and the vagus tells the brain and the brain tells the vagus to turn itself down. And it's just like, once you see that connection, you can't ever unsee it. And chronic inflammation is the biggest cause of not only dementia, but aging, right? So it's, um, it's just, I mean, yeah, wisdom teeth removal. Well, there you go. So wisdom teeth removal is right up there with root canals, I found out. I thought wisdom teeth removal was a pretty much benign thing. And then,
anti-aging water water is your friend so and a good tea i think um so uh my sister had the same 3d it's called a 3d cone beam it's a high resolution uh, CT scan, computerized CT scan. It's a 3D cone beam CT scan. And um, she had, you know, a couple of root canals that we knew about, but then there was these pockets of infection way in the back. Like the bone was just missing. And um, uh, it was from root canals, not root canals, wisdom teeth removal. So when they took out the wisdom teeth, they pack that place in the bone with this stuff that they thought was benign 25 years ago. As it turns out, the stuff that they pack it with gets infected. And so it sits there, doesn't hurt because they've taken the nerves out. I mean, isn't that just wicked? So the article in the Vegas is in the Townsend letter. Let me see if I can write it down. Deborah, can we just clarify that um, that microcurrents and frequency help turn the vagus nerve back on? Oh, I didn't mean because to send it privately. Steffi, you're going to have to send it to everybody else because it says privately then. Um, <laughs> Francesca, can you repeat? Can you clarify that microcurrents so and, and frequency? That is the anti-aging menopause. Take hormones, for goodness sakes, unless you have breast cancer in your family, and I have no risk factors for that. If you're going to take estrogen, you have to take progesterone and don't take estrogen orally. Don't take testosterone orally. Hunt around until you find a doctor that was trained after 1980 that actually knows something about topical women's hormones. And um, uh, yeah, that part's really fun. All right. Franny and Deborah. Oh, can you clarify? Oh, microcurrents and frequency specific turn the vagus nerve on. All right. So we have a, a protocol that's standard. It's called the concussion protocol. And Van Gelder is the old osteopath we got the frequencies from in the 1950s. And um, he felt that the vagus nerve, the medulla was the key to all the problems in the body. Um, when the modella gets traumatized, it um, gets dysfunctional and it has connections to the pituitary, the pituitary regulating hormones get all cattywampus. I don't think Dutchmen use the word cattywampus, but you know what I mean, right? So the pituitary stops working right, the endocrine system stops working right, and so we've always treated the medulla. Well, as it turns out, there was a frequency on the list for the vagus. And the first time I ever used it, I was, um, had been asked to, had been flown down to um, Beverly Hills to work in a cardiologist's office for the day after I was on Jeff Bland's functional medicine update. And um, I was in this cardiologist's office and this man came in in ventricular tachycardia. Now, I'm a chiropractor. I sold drugs for cardiology, for cardiology but I don't even play a cardiologist on TV. Like it was way outside my scope. But there was this frequency of the vagus and everybody knows that the vagus slows down the heart rate. So this man came in with his heart rate. Now the ventricles are the bottom part of the heart and the atria are the top part of the heart. The left vagus controls the speed of the ventricles, slows it down. The right vagus controls or slows down the atria. So this man comes in ventricular tachycardia, which means that his, the lower part of his heart is beating so fast that it's out of rhythm. It's like, it just can't keep up with itself. And the top part is discoordinated from the bottom part. It's a mess. And his heart rate was 147. And it's like, well, I'll just run increased secretions in the vagus. I'm a chiropractor. His heart rate went from 147 to 67 in about 30 seconds. And it scared the snot out of me. I mean, it was like, okay. And then as soon as I shifted off that frequency, it zipped back up. So we played with it up and down and up and down. We couldn't get it to stick because I didn't know enough at the time. So the cardiologist says, ah, oh, it's okay. We'll send him across the street and get him converted. But that 
warned me off of ever treating the vagus again. It's like, what do I, what if I do that to somebody who's got a heart rate of 67, what'll happen? Well, there's this practitioner named Diana Cross. She's a GP in Australia. And she gave a workshop at the symposium four years ago, 1917, it was probably 15, I think, 15 or 17. And she talked about Kevin Tracy's work. So those of you that read medical stuff, Kevin Tracy is an MD, you can even Google him. And his articles are about how the vagus nerve regulates the immune system. And there's this whole, she did this whole presentation on the vagus. And I looked at that and went, I gotta learn how to do this. So I am the number one FSM lab rat. And so I sat on the couch, my resting heart rate is 63, 64. Um, so I sat there and I put a contact around my neck and put another contact on my belly. And I ran the frequency to increase secretions in the vagus. And my heart rate went, yes, that's a good face, Francesca. Um, my heart rate went from 67 to 62 and then back up to 67 and it was fine. Then I ran it on George and his heart rate's about 72 and it went from 72 to 68 and back up to 72 and it's like, so we tried it on people and what we found is if the heart rate is being caused by vagal dysfunction, I can turn off atrial fibrillation in 20, 30 minutes. It's just not that hard. You have to figure out where the atrial fib came from. Is there an infection? Is it a drug? Is it a whatever that's causing the vagus to be stupid or to, to, it's causing the vagus to not work right. So it allows the heart to speed up. And then, um, but, then we started using it for people with gastroparesis and candida and SIBO and all the digestive system dysfunctions, autoimmune disease, um, vocal cord dysphonia. Do you know that the vagus has motor fibers? The vagus is why you can speak. There's one set of nerves that open your vocal cords so you can breathe in. And you ever notice that you always talk as you exhale? and that singers have to control their exhale. There's one set of motor nerves regulated by the vagus that open your vocal cords so you can breathe in, and then another set of nerves that close your vocal cords so that you can speak. So we had a, a practitioner that came to the course in Phoenix in February of this year. Lovely lady in her, I'd say late 60s, early 70s. And she had dysphonia. She had dysphonia which means she couldn't talk past that. So she was constantly hoarse and her voice was very soft. And um, so I said, what caused it? They say they don't know. They say they don't know. Well, I said, well, no, that just means nobody ever asked. What happened right before? Well, I had this virus infection. Oh, all right. What turns off the vagus? Where was the virus infection? It was in my nose and throat and whatever. Okay, so you got a virus in your throat. The virus chains is signaling the vagus. The vagus told the brain, hey, there's an infection here. The brain told the vagus to go off and the vagus nerve stopped working. So we treated increased secretions in the vagus. We used the frequencies for virus and pathologic virus in the vagus and influenza viruses in the vagus. We've got a list. We ran all of those increased secretions in the vagus her heart rate was fine. We always keep a pulse meter on just to make sure. And um, then there's frequencies for vocal cords. So her vocal cords were weak. So once her voice came back to normal, I had her do voice exercises. Then we had to teach because the vagus links up in your spinal cord with the nerves that work your diaphragm. Well, her diaphragm hadn't worked in 17 years to regulate the breathing to control the vocal cords. So the second day we did the neck to the diaphragm to get the diaphragm to work and did diaphragm exercises, to teach her how to breathe again. And the dysphonia was gone on day three and she'd had it for 17 years. So what happens when you give someone their voice back, right? 
So the vagus has all of these things. You ever have the inside of your ear itch so much that it, you, know, you want to dig at it with a toothpick or something while they tell you not to do that? Do you know that's your vagus nerve? The vagus nerve controls sensation. This inside part of the ear and the outer ear canal is regulated by the vagus, right? So when that itches, it's because something is irritating the heck out of the vagus in your gut or someplace else. So the vagus is no longer suppressing the immune system in that inner ear, in that ear canal, and it itches like crazy. So back when I had all my food allergies, my ear was just itching. And this immunologist that basically trained me, and he was one of the first people that saved my life, Vince Marinkovich says, do your ears itch? And I said, something fierce, why is that? And he said, well, it's all these foods you're allergic to. And then he explained the connection between the vagus and the ear and the itching and the gut and the food allergies and all that stuff. And little did we know that that was the first time I'd gotten exposed to mold. That was the black mold in the clinic that first colonized my sinuses and colonized my gut, turned my vagus off, my ears itched, my gut leaked like crazy, and I was IgE allergic to every food I was eating. And it was just like, oh, okay. So when we fixed my gut, my ears stopped itching. Isn't that neat? So 81 hertz increased secretions in the vagus, but then you have to figure out and address what's turning the vagus off because it doesn't just come from space. You don't just get autoimmune disease or Hashimoto's thyroid from aliens, right? Something caused it. And the thing that caused it is what turned your vagus off that allowed the immune system to get confused. So it's just, it's really fun. All right, where are we? Um, HRT patch led to bleeding. Yeah, right. Well, yes, HRT might not be right for everything, but I'm going to um, huh, got to tell you, anybody that would provide hormone replacement patch, estrogen, um, uh, without progesterone, that's a deal breaker. You have to have progesterone or you will bleed. And early in menopause, you have to cycle them. You wear the estrogen full time and you use the progesterone 28 days and then you have a period until that just stops. Then you reduce the dose of progesterone a bit. That's a piece of cake. But you have to use testosterone to balance it. So yeah, no, you don't ever get to use estrogen. So whoever gave you the HRT patch didn't have quite the whole story. It has to be estrogen. Progesterone protects from both breast cancer and uterine cancer and, uh, and bleeding. So sorry. Um, I don't know how old you are, Lily, but um, it does improve your mood. There's actually, um, and, and your cognitive function, there's actually portions of the brain, the cortex, that have estrogen receptors. So when you feel like, when you hit menopause, you know, you feel like you're, you're, you get kind of stupid. Yeah, that's a real thing. The cognitive function there are estrogen receptors in the brain. I had a friend of mine who had to give a lecture on it. And I was in with the, the three of us in there. She was giving the lecture. The other person was a neurologist. And I got to sit on the couch and listen to the two of them tutor her um, about how to, what was involved in writing these slides and giving this lecture. And it's like there are estrogen receptors in the brain that regulate cognitive function. There are also testosterone receptors in your brain. So this is another book you can read. So it's the, um, uh, it's called, it's Australian, of course. It's called Why Men Don't Talk and Why Women Can't Read Maps. Why Men Don't Talk and Why Women Can't Read Maps. There is a spectrum of the most male brain to the most female brain. And then there are, People are distributed all along that pathway. And the, one of these people was a um, anthropologist, I think. She was a psychologist and he was an anthropologist, I think. Anyway, and they looked at it anthropologically and men, back when we were in the hunter-gatherer stage, men had to go work in packs 
without talking, be completely silent, ignore physical sensations like pain, running through the brambles with little other moccasins on and getting scratched and cut up, not make a sound when they hurt. And they had to be able to have good three-dimensional spatial visualization, follow the elk, coordinate movement, throw the spear, kill the elk, the male humans that could do that, single focus, ignore pain, three-dimensional spatial, kill the elk, those people lived and everybody else starved to death. The women, since the guys were out hunting animals, the women, by the way, you like my hair? That's new. So, so the women had to stay home and multitask. They were wa watch, watching the children, stirring the food, killing the coyotes and the snakes, and uh, maintaining the social fabric and harmony of the village. So when the guys came home with the food, there was somebody there to cook it, and, right? But they had to keep, they had to be able to multitask. Do you know that women can recognize 423 shades of red and men can recognize about 12? That's because the women, and mauve like is not even a color, right, for a guy. So the women who could recognize poison berries versus good berries lived. And the ones that couldn't tell the difference between that red berry and that red berry, those people ate poison berries and died. So the skill set that was developed and passed on, the people that didn't have that skill set died. Well, over time, the hormones regulate that part of the brain that does that thing. The other way I regulated my testosterone dosage. Okay, so a guy can take a map, can look, have you ever noticed it, most men? Can take a look at a map, internalize it in his head, turn it around at three dimensions and tell you, you need to turn right here. And you're looking at the map, trying to figure out which way the car is going because you have to have the map. Have to have the map oriented in the way you're going, right? All right. So the most male brain can look at the map, put it in their head, turn it around in three dimensions. That function is regulated by testosterone in men and women. When I would look at the map on my phone and I'd have to turn the phone a certain way to be able to tell which way I was supposed to go or paper map a certain way, I'd increase my testosterone dose and I could take, until I could take the map, look at it, turn it around in three dimensions. The most female brain cannot look at a map. You have to tell them to turn right at the mobile oil station or at the pink building on the corner. You tell me to turn right at the pink building on the corner. I said, is it east or west? What's the street name? You know, don't give me buildings. So that's, so why men don't talk and why women can't read maps. So there's this continuum from like zero to 350. And in my life, I have always had more friends that were more male. I hung out with the engineers and, and uh, the theater people. And I didn't have much in common with the, the girly girls that did makeup and, um, uh, you know, talked about people and um, gossiped and, and talked about stuff. I like talking about ideas and I like taking apart engines and I like thinking through things. So I was right, I was right at 150. But nuclear physicists, there aren't many women nuclear physicists because they're all down at the most male end because of the way their brains have to work. So if you want to get better at mathematics, have somebody give you testosterone cream. Now it's prescription. And in the United States anyway, they've decided to um, uh, uh, and uh, they've decided to make it prescription, uh, like controlled. All right, where are we? Sorry. Yes, Marcy, you're absolutely correct. All right. Why some people are immune to COVID, some are not. Uh, frequency, emotions, and stress. This is Janet. COVID is a uh, so SARS-2 virus, and it attaches to the ACE2 receptor. Now, the ACE2 receptor is 
everywhere. It's why COVID is so multi-system. It's in the brain, the lungs a lot, but in the heart, the capillaries, the blood vessels, um, the digestive system, the testicles, um, the liver and the kidneys. And the ACE2 receptor does have to do, its expression is right, like everybody has them everywhere, but its expression has to do with, um, does have to do something with stress. Now, the other thing is with COVID, they know for sure that people with higher vitamin D levels do not get as sick and almost none of them die. If, you're, if your vitamin D levels are in the 60 to 100 drains, there's almost no fatalities. The people that die have their vitamin D down between zero and 20. Vitamin C, your white blood cells import vitamin C at 60, 60, 60 times the concentration it is in any other tissue in your body. It has little pumps that actually pump vitamin C into the cell. And then that increases the cell's activity. Um, and when the cell gets to something that's bad, it uh, packages up the vitamin C and makes little bombs at it and throws it at the bacteria and the viruses. So um, if you were a hamster or a cat or a horse, you would make a thousand milligrams of vitamin C a day if you're a hamster. I mean, a people size hamster, you'd make one gram of vitamin C a day. Good news is we have opposable thumbs and a big brain. Bad news is we don't make vitamin C. We have to take it in our diet. When our diets were more varied, more plant-based, we got more vitamin C. These days, I bought vitamin C gummies. So when COVID hit in our office, all of my staff, we just had everybody tested. Um, all of our staff are negative. Why is that? Well, number one, we've all been quarantined since March 16th. But number two, I put um, vitamin C gummy candies that I buy on Amazon, any place from 100 to 750 milligrams in a little chewy thing. It's, they think it's candy dish. And then there's elderberry. And now there's vitamin D gummies that are raspberry flavored. And um, no, that is not Kevin. Um, so we've all been munching on those and we had silver lozenges and silver will kill anything. So if you have an orange flavored lozenge with silver in it, you suck on that. And if there's any viruses in your throat, it, the silver kills them. So it's, yeah, the COVID stress. Yes. Do I work on a part-time basis? Well, this is, you know how the universe prevents you with opportunities and said, yep, time to go do that. So I'm really sorry about COVID. Um, Um, uh, but it has gotten me off the road. We won't be traveling there. The United States has got such a bad epidemic and well, we don't want to get me started on politics. Let's not go there. Um, we've got the U S passport is basically not good. Any place else, any place in the world, I can't travel for probably two years. So I'm about to lose my mind because I can't treat patients except during seminars. So we are looking for clinic space and we are going to open a clinic in Portland because um, I don't have a license in Washington. So I'm gonna open a clinic in Portland uh, probably January. I'm booked until the 23rd of September filming and doing this and that. And then after that, we'll look for clinic space, do the build out. It'll be a research center. We'll videotape treatments there. So we have uh, treatments available um, videos available to train practitioners on things like CRPS and SIBO and just kind of get our practicum videos on record. Um, and then I'll have uh, two treatment rooms and a physical therapist that has been treating me for 10 years. She's, um, we're trying to talk her into coming along and, um, and we'll have a research coordinator. So um, that's coming. We'll be lucky if we can get it all together. Uh, we'll, probably be able to open the doors about the middle of January. And, uh, and then we'll see how it goes. It'll be cash only, I'm afraid. I can't afford to deal with insurance companies. I just won't. But we'll have a, um, a policy of 10% of the clinic gross will be pro bono. 
for patients who can't afford treatment and then the nonprofit that we just started. Um, if we can get that funded, people will be able to apply for treatment or the nonprofit will be able to help them buy machines. Um, yes, the patch made you frisky, yes. Well, um, speaking of frisky, um, glad you love my hair, that's adorable. Um, vaginal estrogen, so if you don't need estrogen to prevent hot flashes, but your vaginal tissues uh, get dry and you're, you get you tend towards urethral irritation or bladder infections, and sex becomes someplace between uncomfortable and impossible, use estrogen applied vaginally. They put it in um, oh, something like, um, oh, it's not beeswax, it's coconut oil, or some other kind of substrate that will dissolve and you just put estrogen in it and you apply the estrogen vaginally. And it gets absorbed in the vaginal tissues. And then when the vaginal tissues are all fluffy, they stop absorbing estrogen. So you don't get much systemic release of estrogen. It just works on the tissues that need it. And I commented to my OBGYN, it's like, if I want my libido to come back, testosterone doesn't quite do it. The vaginal estrogen will make my libido, as you say, get frisky. And that's because, and she just said, well, of course, when the vaginal tissues are healthy, then the vagus tells the brain, um, isn't this supposed to be good for something, right? So there's that. Uh, oh, animals. Marcy, thank you. I'm glad you love my hair. Um, why women don't talk and why women can't read maps. It's a great book. Animals. Yes. No, the animals have, yes, we've treated dogs, uh, cats, horses. Horses were my favorite. So in the resonance effect, there's that story about the hunter, the Irish hunter that I treated. And that's just one of many. It's just really fun. And watching a horse get totally stoned. <laughs> that was hilarious. So the horse, like first his eyes get droopy and then his lower lip gets droopy and then his head goes down and then he sort of splays his legs and starts to paw like, I'm sorry, I have to lay down now. And then, so you have to stop the machine, wake up the horse. <sighs> I wasn't sleeping. I was, mm -mm, no, race horses. You put the race horse in a corner of his stall. And the, the trainer said, why do you do that? I said, you'll see in a few minutes. And in a few minutes, the horse has got his legs locked and he's leaning up against the wall, trying not to fall over asleep. So in horses, we've treated the gut um, race horses, the lungs bleed, kidneys, uh, tendons, the musculoskeletal injuries, they're basically sport horses are the ones that most people treat. Uh, COVID-19, yep, got that. If you're a woman and you can read a map, it means that your testosterone levels are adequate and your brain knows what to do with them. So there you go. And you're right there on the spectrum, right? If you can read a map, you're down towards this end. If you haven't a clue what a map was for, then you're up on this end. And if you're someplace in the middle, you're like me, and I can read a map as long as it's turned the way that I'm going, right? Uh, a, a thousand units a day of vitamin C up to 4,000. Um, back when everybody else was getting the flu at chiropractic college, I was taking 10,000 units a day. And I was one of 20% of the people at school that didn't get sick. Silver, um, there's different forms of it. And we just found a company that had silver in throat lozenges and hand cream and uh, hand sanitizer. There are no, there are no uh, viruses or bacteria that are not sensitive to silver. Um, that's why they use it in burn units. Uh, Silvadine has silver in it because it kills everything. I mean, funguses, bacteria, viruses. Silver as in colloidal silver, yes, but micronized silver is better. Oh, Marcy, yes, well, keep an eye out. We're going to put the word out. Um, so 18 years post-menopause, now 73, how to approach taking hormones again. In the UK, are you in the UK, Hazel? Where are you? Wave if you're Hazel. Okay. Oh, there you are. All right. 
So um, you have to find a doctor that's been trained to use hormone replacement. And then you have to make a case to that doctor that justifies why you want to use hormones again. So if it's just vaginal dryness, bladder infections, and impossible sex and no libido, well, then you can get him or her started with just vaginal estrogen. That's an easy sell. And if he doesn't know about it, he said, oh, you don't need that. And it's like, well, you don't need your dick either. So I'm sorry, I'm not even nice. So um, we could just take your testicles off. You won't miss them. You're 73. You don't need all that testosterone. What do you need those things for? You dangly bits. Anyway, I'll leave the diplomatic stuff up to you. Um, so, uh, so you find somebody that's used to how to manage hormones, start with vaginal estrogen and, and then talk him into it. You, you have to sort of match the symptoms to what it is you want them to do. Right. If you go in and say, I want you to give me estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, they're going to be, you're going to tell me how to do my job. That stuff will kill you. You don't need that stuff. It's like, dude. So you say things like, I don't have good muscle recovery. My doctor says I need to exercise, but when I exercise, the muscles are just useless. So I've heard that testosterone would be good to that. Now, an older doctor will say, oh, that'll give you a beard and you don't want that. And acne, it's terrible stuff. No, I don't want oral testosterone. I want topical testosterone. So he doesn't know what you're talking about. You have to find a doctor that already knows how to use those kind of hormones. But vaginal estrogen would be a good place to start because that's an easy sell if he knows what he's doing. And then you just have to match the symptoms that you have with what it is that that hormone is going to do with you. Right? Uh, FSM has helped animals. Oh, already did that one. Link to the silver company. Um, I think we have that on the FSM website. So if you go to contact at frequencyspecific.com and you, you ask, one of the staff will, will let you know that, um, yeah, you've done that. Have you, Francesca? I no, will. but yes, that's the good thing to do. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name. It's on the package and I don't have anything upstairs in the office with me. Um, been there with the doctor. Yeah, you know. Uh, oh, contact at frequencyspecific.com. Contact at frequencyspecific.com. That's the one. And then frequencyspecific.com is the website. And then we have a YouTube channel where most of the, like the questions you had about mechanisms, most of those are answered. Um, yeah, I have, Francesca, it's a good thing you do like listening to me because I've been talking for what, an hour and, an hour and two minutes now. <laughs> well, it's just really fun to look out there and see women my age, you know, because by the time you're our age, it's like, you, right? There's, as my mother, I asked my mom, I was in my 40s when my mom passed. She was 73, I think, 72. 74. She had pancreatic cancer. But the year before that, I'd asked her, it's like, how do you love, how do you, what's it like being 70? And she said, I love it. Now I'm 45 and very vital and like in chiropractic college and on to the next half of my life. And it's like, you like being 73? Why is that? She said, well, I've already survived everything that life has to give me, right? You, what are you going to do? Die? Well, I'm going to die sometime in the next 10 years anyway. So what I got to lose? So there's this thing that happens with your mouth. You say what you think, right? And you don't put up with nonsense the way you used to, right? So the, the, my comments about, oh, let's take your testicles off then. Thank you very much. I'll find a different doctor. Sometimes I might not be too rude, but you know. So there's a thing. It's really fun. Dyspraxia. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure what dyspraxia is. What is it? Oh, Janet, I'm glad you liked the book. Yeah, that's probably the, and there's another book coming. That book's called The Road Back. 
And that's, I have to have time to write it after we get the clinic started next year. Uh, how long do you run FSM programs for? I have uh, one protocol concussion in Vegas runs about 60, 70 minutes and I run it on a magnetic converter that takes the electrical pulses and converts them to magnetic pulses. I'm too busy during the day to run it on myself except now I had my eyes, my eyelids done uh, three weeks ago and the outcome, I'm now at three weeks where they expect people to be at about 10 weeks. So the bruising's gone, the scarring's gone, the sutures have dissolved. I got to wear makeup today. You're my practice group. And it's like, well, it's not too bad. <laughs> so, um, uh, so those programs were two and three hours long. Back when I fractured my shoulder after I fell off the horse, I had a three-hour program that I ran four times a day. So I was running current on myself 12 hours a day. But um, nobody, nobody, including me, expected that fracture to heal. There were six fractures and a dislocation. It's a plate and eight screws in my left shoulder, right? And um, my vitamin D levels, I took probably 50,000 units a day for six weeks and got my vitamin D levels up to 80. Um, so 12 hours a day is kind of the max, but mostly an hour or two. So I run one 90 minute program at bedtime. And then when I wake up at three o'clock to go to the bathroom, uh, I run another one. Uh, some people are more sensitive to the effects. Developmental delay, autistic spectrum. Yeah, we do pretty well with autism, as you'll see um, on, uh, as you'll see on uh, the website. There's a video on uh, by his name is Steve Bunker. We call him Steve the Dad, and uh, he had a he married a woman that had a 19 year old um, autistic son. And after about three years of dealing with a kid with 12 words and complete inability to care for himself, they started doing diet and um, supplements. And then they found FSM. And in three months of running basically the concussion protocol on the kid, his vocabulary went from 12 words to 450. He could shower himself, brush his teeth, ate vegetables and fruit. I mean, it's just a, it's a heart warming video. Nothing's ever a hundred percent. And I think it, but the kid was severely autistic at 19 and at the age of 22, he had a sense of humor. He played uno. He ate only gluten-free food. Um, yeah, glad you, some of the, some of the skin stuff is genetic. I had an aunt that was like 80 before she looked 60. It was creepy. And she's, do you remember the movie, The Picture of Dorian Gray? Remember that movie? Right, there's a picture. So she, her response was like, what did you do to your skin? How do you look like that? And she said, oh, I have a picture in the attic that looks like hell. <laughs> so, well, it's 11.15, it's 7.15 your time. What do you think, right? This is fun. This is like having a ladies group where I don't have to get actually, you know, out of the house. It's good to fun. And next time we'll figure out why it is the damn speakers don't work. I don't know what that's about. Um, thanks for visiting. Yes, I, two thumbs up. Um, and we will let everybody know. If Francesca, if you can send me everybody's email address, um, I'll have Kevin put it on our group mail account where we announce webinars and courses and so you can find our practitioner list on the website. That should be repaired sometime soon. And we do have practitioners in the UK and in the US. And once my clinic is open, it's, it's, well, I'm so excited about that. I'll have a research department and it'll be the home base for the American Academy of Resonance Medicine. And uh, we have to find a name for it. Somebody suggested uh, McMakin, Kevin wanted my name on it, which I'm not too thrilled about, but McMakin Therapy Clinic or something like that. So we'll see what to call it. Because it's not just for pain, it's for all sorts of things. So you all go have a good day, have a good night, sleep well, uh, sleep the sleep of the just and the mentally stimulated. And uh, I guess I'll see you 
Ellen Curry. Oh, I'm glad you had a good time, Dee. That's I've just had a blast. This is great. Everyone to buy your books, you've revolutionized medicine and healing. And we appear to have done that. And that's been our goal from the beginning because we're changing medicine, but we do it one patient at a time. I can't change medicine. It's not my goal. My goal is to change one life. And when you change one life, you change the world. And even if the change in that one life is for you being kind to somebody that you see in the, in the grocery store or saying an encouraging word or giving a dollar to someone that's homeless uh, or a pound or whatever, um, you change that one life. You tell someone, of course you can do it. I believe in you. You can do this. When you change that one life, you have you individually have the ability to change the world. There was a program on when I was a kid called it's um, it was Bishop Sheen, and his his opening credit was a match. There's a black screen, and it was a match, and he lit a candle. And the opening line was, "It's better to light one candle than cur the, curse the darkness." Right. So I think that's what we'll go all do all go and do. Yeah, I think maybe we should do this again. Huh? This is fun. Yay. Okay, invite me back. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Next time the speakers will work. <laughs> Thank you Have so, a good night. so much. You're welcome. It was great fun. Thanks for asking me. You're just lovely. Oh, lipstick and specs, blend with the hair. Yeah, these are like my number one colors. See, purple and blue. And then our logo is purple and blue. It's kind of all color coordinated thing. Goodbye, dears. Have a good day. Do good things. Yes. Bye. Bye. I'm going to stop the video and